Church this morning, I want you to turn to Joshua chapter 2. We'll begin at verse 1. Joshua 2. God love you, Pastor Roger, and so do we. Thank you. I knew that. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. God's good and never changed. I love it, love it, love it. I got you some humorous stories this morning, some medicine. I was like very hard to good like medicine. Some of us need some medicine this morning. Amen? Amen. This first one's on Joel. It's a blonde joke. A blonde has short pains in her side, so she goes to the hospital. The doctor examines her and says, You have acute appendicitis. The blonde says, That's sweet, doc, but I came here to get medical help. <laughs> Why can't a blonde dial 911? She can't find the 11. <laughs> there was a guy at a bar looking at his drink. He stays like that for half an hour. Then a big troublemaking truck driver steps up next to him and takes the drink from the guy and just drinks it all down. The poor man starts crying. The truck driver says, come on, man, I was just joking. Here, I'll buy you another drink. I just can't stand to see a man cry. No, it's not that, the man replies, wiping his tears. This day is, a, is the worst of my life. First, I oversleep and I go into the lake to my office. My outraged boss fires me. When I leave the building and go to my car, I found out it was stolen. The police said they can do nothing. I get in a cab to go home. When I get out, I remember I left my wallet. The cab driver just drives away. I go inside my house where I find my wife in bed with the gardener. I leave my home, come to this bar, just when I was thinking about putting an end to my life, you show up and drink my poison. That's a bad day, amen? Teacher said, which book has helped you most in your life? A student said, my father's checkbook. Mass teacher said, if you have five bottles in one hand, and six in the other hand, what do I have? Student says, a drinking problem. <laughs> Amen? <coughs> Joshua 2. I'm going to read this to him too from the Living Translation. Then Joshua sent two spies from the Israeli, Israeli camp at Achaia to cross the river to check out the situation on the other side, especially at Jericho. They arrived at an inn operated by a woman named Rahab, who was a prostitute. They were planning to spend the night there, but someone informed the king of Jericho that two Israelis were, who were suspected of being spies had arrived in the city that evening. He dispatched a police squadron to Rahab's home, demanding that she surrender them. They are spies, he explained. They have been sent by the Israeli leaders to discover the best way to attack us. But she had hidden them, so she told the officer in charge, the men were here earlier, but I didn't know they were spies. They left the city at dusk as the city gates were about to close, and I don't know where they went. If you hurry, you can probably catch up with them. But actually, she had taken them up to the roof and hid them beneath a pile of flax that were drying there. So the constable and his men went all, went all the way to the Jordan River looking for them. Meanwhile, the city gates were kept shut. Rahab went up to talk to the men before they retired for the night. I know perfectly well that your God is going to give my country to you, she told them. We are all afraid of you. Everyone is terrified if the word Israel is even mentioned. For we have heard how the Lord has made a path through the Red Sea for you when you left Egypt. And we know what you did to Sihon and Og, those two Amorite kings east of the Jordan, and how you ruined their land and completely destroyed their people. No wonder we are afraid of you. No one has any fight left in them after hearing things like that. For your God is the supreme God of heaven, not just an ordinary God. Aren't you glad he's not an ordinary God? Amen. Yeah. Now I beg for this one thing, swear to me by the sacred name of your God that when Jericho is conquered, you will leave me, let me live along with my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all their families. This is only fair for the way I've helped you. The men agreed, if you don't betray us, we'll see to it that you and your family aren't harmed, they promised. We'll defend you with their lives. Then since her house was on top of the city wall, she let them down by a rope from a window. Escape to the mountain, she told them, hide there for three days until the men who are searching for you have returned, then go on your way. But before they left, the men had said to her, We cannot be responsible for what happens to you unless this rope, the King James says, a scarlet thread. 
is hanging from this window unless all your relatives, your father, your mother, your brothers, and anyone else are here inside the house. If they go out into the street, we assume no responsibility whatsoever, but we swear that no one inside this house will be killed or injured. However, if you betray us, then this oath will no longer bind us in any way. I accept your terms, she replied, and she left the scarlet rope hanging from the window. The spies went up to the mountain and stayed there three days until the men who were chasing them had returned to the city after searching everywhere along the road without success. Then the two spies came down from the mountains and crossed the river and reported to Joshua all that had happened. The Lord will certainly give us the entire land, they said, for all the people over there are scared to death of us. Church, what I want to talk to you about this morning is overcoming your past. You know, your past, no matter how bad, doesn't have to stop you from being a part of the plan of God. Amen. You can, with God's grace and forgiveness, overcome your past. Yeah. I heard the story of, of two friends who were talking to each other. One remarked to his friend, Man, you look so depressed. Whatever could you be thinking about to depress you so? His friend quickly replied, My future. Your future, his friend said. Whatever in the world would make it so look so hopeless? To which his miserable friend sighed and and unhappy said, my past. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great if we never had any problems with our past? However, <clears throat> most of us know that the past can load us down with baggage like guilt, depression, fear. The past can certainly affect us and push us down. Everyday people carry scars from their past, and often these scars are still painful and they're still tender. A seminary professor used to say, there's no such thing as a family that's not dysfunctional in some way. We know that the family ought to be a place where love and safety and security can be found, but a lot of times that's not true. We hear terms today like codependency, chemical addiction, sexual and verbal abuse, and all these take part in families. In 1999, this is way back in 1999, it was found that 826,000 children were victims of abuse and neglect in the United States. Now, if it was that bad in 1999, you can imagine what it's like today. Yes, I doubt there's a family here today that in some way has not been touched by divorce. We've all heard the statistics that cite that roughly one half of every marriage ends in divorce. Forty percent of young women before the age of 20 become pregnant here in the United States. Many raise children and single moms, one of the fastest growing segments of the American population. This leads to a lot of hardship a lot of economic problems, including proper health care. They say that children of dysfunctional families take one of four different roles. They either become very controlling, or they're filled with self-hatred, or they become filled with low self-worth and try to become people pleasers, or they try to withdraw completely to themselves. These roles are taken on because of their attempt to escape their past. The reason I'm bringing all this up is that I want you to see that there is a lot of hurting people with a lot of baggage that we encounter every day. Sometimes we're so focused on our own problems and what we're going through that we're not even aware of what's going on around about us. We're not even aware of the people that God puts in our past and puts in our life for us to be a life and to minister to. We're so focused on us that we can't see that God's going to use us to get our focus off of what we're going through and help somebody else so He can work on your behalf. Amen? Amen? Amen. These people all have a past. They become labeled as losers, failures, troublemakers, insecure, all because either they or someone else close to them made some mistakes. Aren't you glad that God is a God of a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance? Yes. Amen? Guess what? Every single one of us in here has a past. Oh, yeah. Every one of us is carrying baggage from our past that influences us. It's important to know that your past doesn't have to keep you out of the plan of God. Mm -hmm. Rahab was a woman with a past. Very little men is mentioned about her in the scriptures. Yes, she's a very fascinating character. This woman who came from a pagan background was able to start over and begin a journey that included her receiving the inheritance of Israel, even to the point that she was included in the ancestry of the Messiah. Amen. 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 
The woman with a past was even included in God's hall of faith. Hebrews 11, 31 says, By faith the heart and Rahab perished not, but them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. Talk about the wonderful grace of God. Amen. For those who say that God's grace can't be found in the Old Testament, they need to look at Rahab. Amen. Amen. By faith she did not perish, and by faith she received her inheritance. There are three details in this passage of Scripture that I wish to share with you this morning from the life of Rahab that show how she overcome her past and how she was blessed by God. Some of us, we've allowed our past to keep us from having a future. We're so focused on what's going on behind us that we can't see what God's doing in front of us. Amen. 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 Rahab certainly had a past. When you think about her past condition, you can't help but thank God for His grace. You see, today, I doubt if anyone would want Rahab to chair their women's ministry. I doubt that Rahab would be the type of person that you'd want to teach your children in Sunday school. Got quiet, didn't it? Most of the church and I wouldn't even want a woman like Rahab attending for they would be afraid that people would talk. Rahab was a Canaanite from Jericho. She was the wrong religion. Rahab was from Jericho. Jericho was her home. No doubt it was all she ever knew. She was a Canaanite through and through. And God had demanded the destruction of the Canaanites. Deuteronomy 7.1 says, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Gergesites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. Well, there's a lot of acts in that country, wasn't there? There's a lot of acts in our lives. God has given us some promises. God wants to do something in your life. But He says, you've got to get rid of these ice out of your life. Amen? Yes. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show no mercy unto them. These people worshipped Baal, and they did so through gross acts of sexual immorality. Even practiced child sacrifice. One of the things that they would do was when they built a new home, they would sacrifice a baby and bury the body in the foundation of the house to bring prosperity. Yeah. Leviticus 18.25 says, And the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Their practices and behavior were so bad that God even said the very land vomited them out. In Leviticus chapter 18, there's a series of commands given to Israel regarding things like forbidding sexual relationship with family members or with animals or with members of the same sex. And it's been discovered that the Canaanites practiced all of these. Homosexuality was encouraged among them. Bestiality was also common. The Canaanite culture was seeped in sin and fornication. Abortion was common as well as just killing unwanted children. No wonder God said the very land vomits them out. Rahab was from Jericho, was a Canaanite. And God said, don't show them no mercy, destroy them. Rahab was a harlot. How would you like to be identified in the Bible as Rahab the harlot? Think about that. Not David the great man of valor, but this is Rahab the harlot, Rahab the prostitute. And that's how she's known. Yeah. Now I realize in recent years there's been a move to somewhat softness. Some Bible scholars have said that she was just the innkeeper to somewhat take away her reproach. They don't like the idea that God would choose a prostitute including his genealogy as a Savior. You know what? You know men did not write the Bible. Yeah. If we wrote the Bible, we'd make ourselves look good, wouldn't yeah. we? God shows the good, the bad, and the ugly. Amen. Amen? Isn't it interesting that in Matthew's account of the lineage of Jesus, only three women mentioned were all involved in sexual sin. Rahab, a prostitute, Bathsheba, an adulteress, and Tamar, who committed incest with her father-in-law. Think about the amazing grace of God. The Hebrew word for harlot used in uh, Joshua 2.1 is zanah, 
which means a harlot, go a whoring, commit fornication, be a harlot, play the harlot, to commit adultery. It's never used in any form to describe just an innkeeper. The Greek word used in the New Testament to describe Rahab is a word prone from which we get the word pornography. Rahab was a prostitute. Never once is a husband mentioned. Why? As a harlot, she didn't need one. Where was the one place that two strangers such as the Hebrew spies could go in a city and not attract a lot of attention? To a harlot's place. Let me ask you a question. Did Rahab have a past? Yes. Some of us, we think, oh, my past is so bad, God could never use me. Then you begin to look around at some other people's past and look what God's done with them. Amen. By all accounts, she should have perished with the rest of the Canaanites in Jericho. Was she any better than them? No, she was guilty of sin. Maybe even worse. If ever there was a person whose past should have hindered them, it should have been Rahab. Her past was shady. Her past was immoral. We can only imagine what a typical day for Rahab must have been like. However, there was one day that she heard about the children of Israel. Maybe a customer made mention of these Israelites of how God had dried up the Red Sea for them a generation ago. Or maybe she had heard it from the streets of Jericho. She had heard about this group that had come out of Egypt who worshipped an invisible God. See, they all worshipped things that they created. Statues. All kinds of things that they made with their hands. This is something I, I never will understand about people. How can you worship something you created? I want to worship something greater than me. Amen? She had heard how this invisible God had already delivered the kingdom of Sihon and all the Amorite kings into their hands. Maybe she had heard how God had cared for them and provided for them for 40 years in the wilderness. And no doubt she had heard of God's promised inheritance of delivering Canaan into their hands. People need to hear what God's done in your life. No matter how big a mess you are, we talked about this a little bit Wednesday night. Romans 8 says there is now no condemnation of those who are in Christ. If you're in Christ, don't let the devil condemn you. Amen. Don't let him beat you up. Jesus carried your guilt. He carried your sin. He carried your condemnation so we don't have to carry it. Amen? Amen. But she heard about this king, about this God, and all that he had done. <laughs> Sometimes we need to tell people what God's done or not. We need to share our testimony. He said he overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Amen. Most of our testimony, oh, I don't know where God's at. I'm going through this. The devil's been chasing me all week long. Man, you got it all messed up. You need to read your Bible. He's not supposed to be chasing you. You're supposed to be chasing him. Amen. Amen. He's already defeated. <laughs> yeah, but he reminded me how big a mess I was. Really? Well, then that's, that, that, that's cool, but don't listen to what he says. Let God remind you of the success he wants you to be. Amen. Start seeing yourself the way God sees you, church. Amen. We talked about this Wednesday night. Quit being so sin conscious, become more God conscious. Amen? Amen? If you become more God conscious, you won't worry about the sin. Amen. One day she got up in the morning. Back in that day, it goes just like any other. But God had other plans. You ever done that? Got up and had your day all planned out, and all of a sudden God begins to change it. Amen? As the evening approached, two men were secretly coming to her house. The grace of God was directing him, just as the grace of God directed you to an altar when you got saved. They entered in somehow, some way Rahab recognized them as being Israelites. Now Rahab is seen by faith. Somehow the king of Jericho had heard about these spies and he sent word to Rahab to deliver them up. Now Rahab was faced with a choice. She could deliver up the spies and go about her normal business or she could take the step of faith and have her world turn upside down. Same with us, church. Every day we get up and we go through the motions and go through the things we do every day or we can take a step of faith and believe God He's going to do something that's going to turn our world upside down. He's going to use you in a supernatural way today. He's going to use you to touch somebody's life, to minister to somebody. Amen? Amen. 
If we step out in faith, we need to understand that we're going against the status quo. Things are going to be different. If the king found out she'd hit the spies, she'd be executed for treason. You have to count the cost if you're going to believe God. What would Rahab, Rahab do? I believe she was tired of the past that had kept her down. Some of us, church, we, get, we need to get tired, sick and tired of being sick and tired. Amen. 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 Men after men had came and went, leaving her with just a little more money, but never with any real happiness. When these spies came to her, she had a choice to continue to live that the life, her little life that her past dictated to her, or believe God and step out in faith and claim the inheritance that went with being part of the people of God. You have a choice every day when you get up. Either to believe God or believe what the world's telling you, believe what your body's telling you, believe what everybody else is telling you. Amen? Amen. So she chose to take a step in faith. She took the two spies and led them into the rooftop. <coughs> and there she hid them among the stacks of flax. Listen to her words as she speaks to these spies. I know that the Lord hath given you the land. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and earth beneath. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Is Rahab operating faith? I believe she is. 11, Hebrews 11, 6 says, Without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a reward of them that diligently seek him. Amen? Amen. There are two dimensions of faith mentioned here in Hebrews 11, 6. <clears throat> Most of them never get past the first one, which is believing that he is. Rahab was just like us. She had never seen God. She wasn't raised and taught about God. She had never laid eyes on his glory, but by faith she knew he existed. You've never seen God. I've never seen God. We've seen the manifestations. We've seen the results, but we've never seen God. You have to take him by faith. And that's what she was doing, church. Amen. Yes. She said, He is God in heaven above. Here's what I want you to see. This is the reason she refused to let her past continue to control her life, to keep her down and out, for she entered the second dimension of faith. She believed that God was and is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Amen. Oh, we seek God when we have crises or when we have turmoil in our lives. But he said those who diligently seek Him. Amen. Wednesday night we were talking about the flesh and the Spirit. You know what it really gets down to? You either love God or you love you Amen. most of all. That's really what it boils down to. When you first fell in love with God, you fell in love with God so much that you just you didn't love you as much. You loved Him, and you want to do everything you could do to please Him. Amen. Same way in marriage. When you first fall in love with someone and get married, oh, you can't be out of their sight. You don't want to be away from them. I mean, you just do everything. You just deny yourself and just want to please them. But after a period of time, what happens? Still love them. But we don't have that zeal, that enthusiasm. And the same with God. At first, we'll deny ourselves and do anything God tells us to do. And then after a while, we've served God for a while. And that's, well, God, I'll, I'll do it when I can get to it. Or I'll spend time with you when I have time to get around to it. And then we end up going, why is God not moving heaven and earth for me? What are we doing for God? Where is He, where is he in our list of priorities in our life? Amen. Amen. We want Him to be first place in doing things for us, but yet we're not putting Him first place in doing things for Him. Amen. The devil wants to tell you, God won't bless somebody like you. I don't know about you, but I hear that all the time. But you're a pastor. It doesn't matter. I heard a preacher this morning was talking about uh, when they went after Osama bin Laden, how he was a high-priority target and how they sent all these special forces and stuff after him. And he was talking about us Christians. You've been serving God for a while. You're a high priority target. 
The devil's got your number. He wants to shut you up. He wants to shut you down. Amen? So, oh, why is all this happening to me? Because you're a threat to the enemy. He'll tell you, oh, he can't bless somebody like you. You're just not worthy to be blessed of God. God can't use somebody like you. You won't ever be able to change. You'll never break the bonds from your past. One of the things that our studies tells us today that abuse, be it sexual, physical, or chemical, is that if you uh, if you grew up in that, most likely you become that. If your parents were alcoholics, you probably will become an alcoholic. If you were physically abused as a child, you probably will be an abusive parent to your children. This is what psychologists call the cycle of abuse. Without God, there's a lot of truth in the cycle of abuse. People do tend to repeat the mistakes of the past. And there's such things as generational sins. However, God is the unknown variable in the formula of life. God can change all this. Oh, I'm the way I am because of my way my grandpa was, or my daddy was, or my mama was. No. no. You're a brand new creation in Christ. He is just one of the You don't have to be the life of God. That's not who you are anymore. I didn't say you weren't going to make mistakes. I didn't say you weren't going to fall short. But that's not who you are. Amen. Hurting people hurt people. Yes. Here Rahab takes a step of faith. Not only did she believe God exists, she believed He was a warrior or blessed of those who seek Him. And she knew that God had commanded every Canaanite to be killed. She knew that according to God's decree, she had no chance. However, like Abraham, when interceding for Lot, she's moving in faith. Like the Syrophoenician woman whom Jesus called the dog, she's moving in faith. She knows that God has rewarded those who diligently seek Him, so she asks the spy not only to spare her, but also the life of her family, her father, her mother, her brothers, her sisters, her mom and dads. <coughs> if you've been praying for family members, hear the Word of God. If God will spare the life of a prostitute's family because she believes God, what about yours? Amen. She hung a red thread, a scarlet thread, from her window. And the spies told her, as long as that scarlet thread's there and everybody's in the household, they'll not be harmed. Remember when God told Israel to put blood on your doorposts. And everywhere the blood was applied, judgment passed over. Yes. But they said, anybody outside the house, they're not responsible for. But everybody's uncovered under the blood, the whole family would be saved. Amen. 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 The spies told her to tie that cord, that scarlet cord, but she let them down to, to escape in her window. And she and her house would be spared. <coughs> I've told you many times, faith equals obedience. Yes, Amen. James talks about having faith. But if you've got faith, you say, oh, look at my faith. i got faith. But you've got to have some work to go with that faith. Because right. he said, faith without work is dead. If I really believe this, then I'm going to act like I believe this. Amen. Amen. Amen? She really believed it, so therefore she was acting on what she believed. So many times, we, we believe it, but we're not acting on what we believe. Well, how do I act? Sometimes it's just verbally saying it. Amen. Just speaking it out. Creating by speaking words out. He said, hold fast your confession. That means keep saying the same thing. Oh, I believe God's my healer. I believe by the stripes of Jesus I'm healed. Amen. And all of a sudden the pain hits you. Oh, Lord, I'm hurting her. That's not keeping your confession. It doesn't matter if the pain's coming. God's work still the same. It doesn't change. I'm still here. I'm here to start. that she passed that window, no doubt she said to herself, I'm believing God. When the children of Israel crossed the Jordan, it paralyzed her neighbors with fear. But she said, I'm believing God. You can't be moved by what everybody else is doing. Everybody else can be walking in fear. You've got to remain in faith if you want God's promise to fulfill in your life. You can't listen to what everybody else is saying. You can't look at what everybody else is doing. I don't care if they've somebody been serving God a lot longer than you have. It doesn't matter, church. Amen. 
When Israel marched around the walls for seven days, she said to herself, I'm believing God. You see, she made a choice. You and I have got to make a choice. Let go of your past. You know, one part of, one way of, of uh, torture and punishment for some people was to tie a dead cart <coughs> on their back and let them carry it around. And I think it decay and get into your skin and eventually kill you. That's what we're doing when we're talking about our past and working on living in our past. We're carrying all this garbage, all this luggage, all this baggage, all this hurt, all this disappointment. We're carrying it around with us and it's killing us. And God can't do what He wants to do in our life because we've got all this stuff that we've got to let go of. Amen? Amen? She was a prostitute. But she's a prostitute that was believing in God. Amen. I used to think of, when they talk about Simon the leper, I think, well, I'd hate to have that name. Simon the leper. <laughs> Just Simon. I don't mean no Roger the Mighty Men of God or something like that, you know? <laughs> but I got to reading this and thinking, Rahab the Parlor. I'm thinking, man, <laughs> she's got it worse than he does. Oh, that's my grandma, Rahab the harlot. That's my mom, Rahab the harlot. Oh, no. Amen. Joshua 6.23 says, And the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father, her mother, her brethren, and all that she had. And they brought all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. Her faithfulness, her faith in what she could not see, but acting on what she believed. It did not only save her, it saved her whole family, church. Amen. What you don't realize is it's not just your salvation that's hanging in the balance. Amen. There are people in your family, people that you work with that are watching your life. Amen. They're looking at your life. And they're going to see your faith. Because if it's not working for you, the first thing the devil's going to tell them, if it's not working for them, it ain't going to work for you. Did you catch that? Her whole family was saved. After chapter 6 of Joshua, Rahab is no longer mentioned in the book. But she does not disappear from history. In Matthew 1, verse 5, Simon fathered Boaz of Rahab, and Boaz fathered Obed of Ruth, and Obed fathered Jesse. Did you know that this Rahab became the great-great-grandmother of King David? And from David's lineage, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, both Jew and Gentile, would be born? Think about that. In our Savior's past, in His ancestry, is Rahab the harlot. So don't tell me God cannot use anybody to be part of His plan to fulfill His plan to for our life. Amen? Amen. Amen, sister. I love the scripture where He says He takes the foolish things to confound the wise. He'll use the very person you think not, the one that's the biggest mess. Look at, look at Paul, like Saul's life. The dude said, I'm the chiefest of sinners. He went around killing Christians. But when he had an encounter with God, it changed his whole life. Amen? Amen? And look what he did for the Lord. Also in the New Testament, two biblical writers commend her. In James 2.25, says, Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? She believed and she did. And she was justified. Hebrews 11, 31, By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. She's not only mentioned in the Old Testament, she's mentioned in the New Testament church. She became adopted into the congregation of Israel. She married Salmon, one of the princes of the tribe of Judah, had children, became the great-great-grandmother of David, and is listed in the genealogy of Jesus for all the church to read, and is held up as an example of both faith and and works and is included in God's hall of faith. Amen. So let's tell 
telling you this morning, you cannot overcome your past. She overcame her past. Amen. Won't you listen to this with your heart? David Simmons, a former cornerback for the Dallas Cowboys, tells us about his childhood home. His father, a military man, was extremely demanding, rarely saying a kind word, always pushing him with harsh criticism to do better. The father had decided that he would never permit his son to feel any satisfaction from his accomplishments, reminding him there was always new goals ahead. Sometimes, as parents, we mean well, but we do more harm than we do good. Amen. When Dave was a little boy, his dad gave him a bicycle, unassembled, with the command that he put it together. After Dave struggled to the point of tears with the difficult instruction in many parts, his father said, I knew you couldn't do it. Then he assembled it for him. When Dave played football in high school, his father was unrelenting in his criticisms. In the backyard of his home, every, after every game, his dad would go, up, go over every play and point out Dave's errors. Most boys got butterflies in their stomach before the game. I got them afterwards. Facing my father was more stressful than facing my opposing team. Amen. By the time he entered college, Dave hated his father and his harsh discipline. He chose to play football at the University of Georgia because his campus was further from home than any school that offered him a scholarship. After college, he became the second round draft pick of the St. Louis Cardinals professional football. Joe Namath, who later signed the New York Jets, was the club's first round pick that year. Excited, he telephoned his father to tell him the good news. His father said, how does it feel to be second? Despite the hateful feelings he had for his father, Dave began to build a bridge to his dad. Christ had come into his life during college years, and it was God's love that made him turn to his father. During visits home, he stimulated conversation with him and listened with interest to what his father had to say. He learned for the first time what his grandfather had been, had been like a tough lumberjack known for his quick temper. Once he destroyed a pickup truck with a sledgehammer because it wouldn't start, and he often beat his son. This new awareness affected Dave dramatically. Knowing about my father's upbringing not only made me more sympathetic for him, but it helped me to see that under the circumstances, he might have done much worse. Amen. By the time he died, he said, I can honestly say we were friends. Sometimes, church, we hold things against people, but we don't know what they've gone through. We don't know what's happened to them to cause them to be the way they are. Amen. Maybe all you've ever heard in your past was criticism. Parents, be careful what you say to your kids. Be careful of calling them things like stupid and dumb because it hurts. If you tell a child he or she will never amount to anything, it doesn't take long until they begin to believe it. Maybe you came from that type of home don't let your past hinder you. Maybe you have guilt hidden in your past from something you've done that the devil continues to tell you will keep you from being used by God. You have a choice. Who are you going to believe? Satan or God? Your parents or God? If God will take a prostitute and include her in His plan, guess what? He'll do the same thing for you. Amen. He's God. And His love never changes. Amen. Amen. Now I've heard people say that many times. God's the same. He's no respecter of person. Do you know He's no respecter of person when it comes to His love? His gifts and talents and callings is a different story. But when it comes to His love, He loves us all the same. I want to close in reading this to you. It's called Science Proves the Bible True. To say that true science and the Bible are contradictory is simply not so. If there's even one chance in the meaning that God, heaven, and hell are true, wouldn't you want to know? After all, one day you're going to die. What then? And furthermore, since our children and grandchildren are increasingly exposed to the faults of unbelieving educators, don't you want to be able to answer their questions when they come from home from school or college to steer them in the right direction? Well, guess what? Science proves the Bible is true. The Bible tells the earth floats in space. There was a time when people believed it sat on a large animal or a giant. Seriously. But 1,500 years before Christ, the patriarch Job said, He hangeth the earth upon nothing. Job 26, verse 7. 
Think about that. You can't even hang your hat on nothing. The fact is, science didn't discover that earth hangs upon nothing until 1650 A.D. The Bible tells us the earth is composed of atoms. By faith we understand the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that the things which are seen are not made of things which are visible. Only in recent years has science discovered that everything we see is composed of things we can't see. Atoms. Yet the Bible written more than 2,000 years ago said it was so. Now the Bible doesn't need science to prove that it's true. It just so happened that it does. Think about that this morning, church. Everything in here is the truth. It's the only truth. There is no other way. No shortcuts. This is the truth. And it's been proved time and time and time again. And just like I said this morning, if God will do this for Rahab the heart, guess what? God will do it for you. Amen. You can overcome your past. You're not who you used to be. You're not who people try to say you are. You are who God says you are. Amen. Amen. Oh, I'm just an old addict. I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. Or I'm this, this. No, you're not. That's not what the Bible says. He says you're the righteousness of Christ. And when the devil tries to put you down, remind him, I'm not listening to you. You are a liar. Anything tells you is going to be a lie. I'm listening to what God says because He's telling the truth. I may not feel like it, and sometimes I may not look like it, but God says I am. If He says I am, I'm going to believe Him. And if I believe Him, it's going to change the way I'm going to live, the way I'm going to act, the way I'm going to treat other people. Amen? Amen. If I went by what people said about me, I'd be sitting home today feeling sorry for myself. And some of the things they say is true, probably. I'm not denying it. I was a mess. Big time mess. But God can take a mess like her, a mess like me. He can take a mess like you. He can help you overcome your past. Amen. Thank you. See, I knew some of y'all out in the world. Some of you knew me out in the world. If you're like me, I don't even like to think about some of the things I've done. Amen. Some of the way I've treated people. Some of the things I've said. Mm -hmm. The devil used to try to keep me with guilt over my daughter most of my life. Mm -hmm. He and her would use that guilt against me. For I would enable her to continue doing what she was doing. Then one day God really got in my face and told me, that's not who you are anymore. And you don't have to be in bondage to that anymore. You did what you did. You can't change it. But that's not who you are now. Not what you're doing now. Amen. I'm just trying to really encourage somebody. Somebody, God said, listen this morning. You need to listen to what's been said. Amen. You're not who you used to be. Right. Your past does not have to dictate your future. Amen. You had an encounter with Christ. Things changed right there. Amen. And it's up to you making the choice to believe God and then act on what you believe and watch God do yes. what He's going to do in your Amen. life and fulfill the promises that He said He wants to fulfill in our lives. Amen. And don't look down on somebody else. Because you never know how God's going to use that person. I know all of us, we've met people in our life thinking, oh my Lord. Didn't have nothing kind to say about them. Didn't want to have nothing to do with them. Watch out. God may put them to be your next door neighbor in heaven. Amen. Amen. God has a sense of humor. You don't believe it, look at your neighbor next to you. Church, I just hope to encourage somebody this morning. You're not dictated by your past. You can be a brand new creation of God. Amen. Give God the praise of the Lord. God is good. And His love never changes. Amen. I saw all week long have been playing over my head. God is good. You never change. God is good. You never change. 
When the devil slapped me upside the head this week, this problem, that situation, that word kept going, God is good. He never changes. God is good. He never changes. Amen. As long as I got my focus on God is good, He never changes. Not on the problem, not on the situation. Then I, I just felt exhilarated, like I could do anything. Amen. 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 Come on, give God some praise in my house. Amen. He said, I was glad when they said we could go to the house of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's stand up if you will, please.